Chow. What are they? What are they for? What do they do? What do they taste like? Questions we've all wondered at one point or another. I'm gonna be honest with you, I was never a Chow guy. I just didn't see the appeal of raising some weird little blue baby. Plus it seemed to take forever, so I never really touched this part of the game. I mean sure, I would check it out every now and then, but I wasn't one of those weirdos who would spend hundreds of hours raising these things. I was one of the normal people who spent dozens of hours replaying the game regular style. I mean, don't get me wrong, I always wanted to like raising Chow, I just never really did. But I always wondered, what is it about these little monsters that people found so captivating? It kind of bothered me there was this huge part of the game I barely knew anything about. So I decided to finally bite the bullet and learn about Chow. How complicated could it be, right? Oh, it's complicated. So, what are Chow? Well, they're these little creatures first introduced in Sonic Adventure 1. They have some minor relevance to the plot, but who gives a shit, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the Chow Garden, a feature that was in both adventure games and then never seen again. While the Chow themselves continue to make various small appearances throughout the franchise, basically the Chow Garden is a kind of virtual pet simulator where you can raise your Chow by giving it items to improve its stats and change its appearance, and you can enter these Chow in a series of races that get progressively more challenging. There's also a Chow Karate mode exclusive to Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. The Chow Garden is a completely optional feature in both games, however some emblems are locked behind Chow races, so if you want to 100% either game and get to play that sweet bonus level in Sonic Adventure 2, then you will have to raise some Chow. That's the super basic overview, but where did the idea for Chow come from? Why is it even in the game at all? In the credits for Sonic Adventure 2, they have Chow programmers and artists listed, but there is no Chow section listed in the Sonic Adventure 1 credits. Instead, there's an A-Life section. A-Life, short for Artificial Life, is actually a refinement of an idea they first had for a game called Nights into Dreams, which came out in 1996. This is the game Sonic Team worked on for the Sega Saturn instead of, you know, a Sonic game. It also had a remake come out on PC in 2012. Nights is a game about running around as a boy or girl and then turning into an androgynous purple dream clown and then flying through rings or something. What Nights is about isn't really important to this video, so don't worry about it. What we're going to be talking about are these guys, the little background NPCs of the game. They're called Nightopians, and this is what the original Nights into Dreams webpage had to say about them. Nightopians are carefree, happy inhabitants of Nightopia. They're born every time balls of light, called idea, collide. The sole reason for their existence is to have fun. Because they are incapable of doing anything else, they have no need to work together or to cooperate towards a common goal. As a result, they have no leader and no language. What they do have is the ability to see the consciousness of each visitor, dreamers from our world, through idea. When visitors arrive, the Nitopians can see their consciousness and recreate the happy world that is hidden deep inside. That's why Nitopians, who don't have the capacity for intelligent thought, can sing, dance, and even go fishing. That's pretty fucking weird, but okay. These odd little cherubs aren't quite as cute as Chow, but they're alright. So what's the deal with these guys? The levels are populated with these little dudes, and they go about doing various different things. They can be happy or sad, they can create tiny changes in the landscape, and certain things like background music are even altered depending on the overall mood of the stage. Much like Chow, you can easily play through the entire game completely ignoring them if you want. But they're actually not just a static background element or whatever, you can interact with them. If you drill dash near one, it will become frightened, lowering its mood. You can even do a paraloop to kill one if you want. Although much like real life, this is considered a social faux pas, and it lowers the mood of every other Nitopian in the level. Depending on the mood of the Nitopian, it will either follow you, remain indifferent, or run away. If you have the patience, you can lure two Nitopians together, and when two Nitopians touch, there's a chance an egg will appear. The happier they are, the more likely they are to breed. After a few playthroughs of the same level, known in-game as Days, it will eventually disappear, starting with the oldest ones first. In addition to Nitopians, you can also create Meepians, which are hybrids between the Nitopians and the enemies of the game. You create a Meepian by grabbing a Nightmarin minion and releasing it. As it bounces around the level, if it collides with a Nitopian, there's a chance an egg will be created containing a Meepian. Meepians will have the head, torso, arms, or legs of the enemy type which was used in this creation, so there's a wide variety of possible outcomes. Meepians can also raid with Nitopians and other Meepians to create interesting body part combinations from multiple different enemies. If you have a lot of Meepians in your level and a high overall happiness rating, there's a small chance a Kingpian will appear. 
also known as a super peon. The exact mechanics for spawning one are still not fully understood. Some French site says there's a 1 in 4 chance it happens when a Meepian with the head of a minion breeds with a Meepian that has the head of a regular Nitopian. For a long time it was thought by many to be just an internet rumor before pictures of it eventually surfaced online. To this day there is a shockingly small amount of documentation of this character posted online. So what happens after the King Pian shows up? Well most Pians go away after a few days, but the King will stick around your level for up to 9 days. He'll fly around at first and survey the area, then eventually he'll begin constructing a little castle that will appear over the course of several days. Eventually you'll leave, but after it's done you'll still have the castle permanently added to the background of your level. Now after all that you might be wondering, what exactly was the point of all of this? What does the castle do? Nothing. It just looks cool. Let's say you want to check the status of your peons, see the overall happiness and maybe your Nitopians to Meepian ratio. Well, the thing is, there's no way to do it with a game by itself. But, if you have the demo disc Christmas Nights, there's an unlockable feature called Nitopian Collection, which is the only way you can see information about your Nitopians by looking at your save files from the main game. Christmas Nights is quite a fascinating little oddity. It's a little too much to get into now, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention it contains the first playable appearance of Sonic in a 3D game, predating both Sonic R and Sonic Jam's Museum mode. There's even an inflatable Dr. Robotnik for the boss, but that's for another time. There's a great interview that's been translated over on shmuplations.com about the design philosophy behind the A-Life system at nights, but it's too long to get into here, so I'll have a link to it in the description. Anyways, let's get back to talking about Chow. But the first question is, which version of the Chow Garden should you play? There's two games, or rather to be more precise, there are four distinct iterations of the Chow Garden. There are some features only in Sonic Adventure 1, and there are some features only available in Sonic Adventure 2. And there are some features only available in the Dreamcast games, and there are some features only available in the GameCube games. Hell, technically even these GameCube versions have a few differences from the PC versions, but for the most part these are essentially the same experience. Obviously taking an in-depth look into every single one of these would take too long and be redundant. Luckily it's pretty widely agreed that Adventure 2 Battle has the most robust and complete Chow system. So for the most part this video will be focusing on the Chow system from Battle, but I'll bring up the relevant differences between versions when necessary. Before I begin, I just want to say there's no way in a thousand eons I could have possibly divined all this arcane knowledge on my own. Credit where credit is due, I learned most of what I know from Chow Island, the internet's premier resource on Chow knowledge. So to start raising Chow, first you need to go to the Chow Garden. In Sonic Adventure 1, these are physical locations you visit in the adventure field although you can teleport between them once they're unlocked. In Sonic Adventure 2, you need to find a Chao container and break it to collect a key, which will transport you to the Chao world upon completing the level. From this point on, you can access the Chao world with this character at any point from the level select screen. So when you first enter the Chao Garden, there will already be two eggs waiting for you. When presented with an egg, you have three possible options. Wait patiently for the egg to hatch on its own, which takes about five minutes. Or you can pick it up and shake it gently for a few seconds and then put it down and it should hatch immediately. And of course the proper way, smash that sucker into a wall. Although of course they don't like that. Chow can have a number of different facial expressions, and contrary to a popular rumor, the method of hatching doesn't seem to have any bearing over which expression you get. One of the more striking features of Chow is the little floating ball above their head. This is called their emotion ball and they can change shape to communicate how they're feeling at the moment. Once your Chow is born, the first thing you should do is take it over to the Chow Kindergarten. Once here, go to the fortune telling house. Upon arrival, the first thing she says is, Welcome to the fortune telling house. You won't get your fortune told here. Huh, seems like you might want to consider a different name then. What she will do is allow you to name your Chow. She'll also suggest a random name. Some of her names are pretty good. Papoose, Quincy, Chaz, Chaggy. Jojo, Bruno, Honey, Dixie, Elvis, Woody, Soul in all caps. Look, proof the game is soulful, guys. Smile B in all caps. This is actually a reference to the Sega Studio Smile Bit, the guys who made Jet Set Radio. In fact, I think a bunch of the all cap names are Sega references. Rosso is a name she can suggest, and that was also the name of a Sega development studio. And HITM refers to Hitmaker, also known as Sega AM3. WOW refers to Sega AM1, formerly known as WOW Entertainment. Nagoshi probably refers to Toshihiro Nagoshi, the CCO of Sega. Another area in the kindergarten you can take your child to is the classroom. 
You can leave your chow here and they'll be taught a lesson, either how to play an instrument, how to do a dance, how to exercise, how to sing, or how to draw. You can place up to four chow in the classroom at once. It takes 30 minutes of playing the game outside of the chow garden in order to complete the lesson. There are five different levels of singing ability, the chow learning a new song each time it completes a level. Similarly, there are five levels of drawing, with the chow learning a new picture each class. Chow can actually draw without lessons if it wins the crayons as a prize from one of the chow races. With the crayons, it can draw a chow and any player character it has a close bond with. If you're kind to a chow with a specific character, its bond level will increase, and it will become friendly and come towards you when you approach, whereas if you abuse a chow, it will grow to hate that character and will run away from them. There's also a black market area in which you can buy various items from a cool, shady chow with rings you've collected during the main game, but I'll talk more about him later. You can also take your chow to the health center. If your chow is feeling sick, the chow doctor will give them medicine and make them healthy again. There are a number of sicknesses your chow can get, but none will have any serious lasting effects, and they can all be cured by a trip to the doctor. The doctor will also comment on your chow. On modern games, you can view the medical chart which displays your stats, but in the Dreamcast versions, the only way to check your stats is with the VMU minigame. You can also view your Chow's record page, which keeps track of their minigame performance, and their personality page, which has information on their personality type as well as age and favorite fruit. Chow personalities are not fully understood. Specifically, it's not known how exactly they affect a Chow's actions and behavior, or whether they're genetic traits or not. Personalities also don't work quite how you'd expect. Even though the doctor's office can only display one personality, a chow can have up to three personality types at a time. A chow can even have zero personality types. The chow personalities are gentle, naughty, energetic, quiet, big eater, chatty, easily bored, curious, carefree, careless, smart, crybaby, lonely, and naive. The last main area of the kindergarten is the principal's room. He just gives a variety of tips. It's some pretty useful information if you know absolutely nothing about Chow. There are two different types of trees in the Chow garden. One grows in the garden and never dies. Other types of trees grow from the seeds that you can buy from the black market. These trees grow and later die. Cool, good to know. Now how do I plant the seeds? How to plant the seeds? Well that's a secret. Gee, thanks a lot, asshole. Actually, I'm the Chow Doctor. Okay. Wait, what? I saw the Chow Doctor, he's over in the other room, and you're not him, he's got those crazy eyebrows. So why the hell would he say this? Well, as you may suspect, it turns out it's just a simple translation error. The Japanese word hakase can be translated as either doctor in an academic sense, meaning someone with a doctorate, not necessarily a medical doctor, or as professor or expert. So with the actual Chow Doctor one room over, it's clearly should have used a different word, but hey, that's far from the only issue with Sonic Adventure 2's translation. Anyways, let's head back to the actual Chow Garden now. Once you get bored of watching your Chow crawl around and flail about in the water, it's time to start raising their stats. You do this by playing through the stages and defeating enemies, collecting animals, and in Sonic Adventure 2, Chaos Drives, and then giving them to your Chow. The four main stats are Swim, Fly, Run, and Power. These are all fairly self-explanatory. Your Chow starts off crawling, but after 50 points in Run, he can start walking. The higher the stat, the faster he goes. Once your chat reaches 100 points in swimming, it'll stop splashing helplessly and begin to actually swim. For flying, well they don't really fly exactly, but the fly stat determines their speed and distance traveled after jumping off a big ledge. Power is probably the least obvious, but it affects both the chow's climbing speed and how fast they can shake the nut down from the tree, as well as how fast they can push the beach ball in Sonic Adventure 1. The fifth stat, Stamina, is a little different from the first four. It doesn't affect the Chow's appearance or evolution at all, and it's not raised through animals or drives. You have to feed the Chow fruit that grows from the trees in the garden, or items bought directly from the black market with rings. It is nonetheless quite an important stat. There's a stamina bar that slowly drains while a Chow is racing, and you have the option to cheer the Chow on for an additional speed boost at the cost of using some stamina. Once the Chow runs out, it will begin to move extremely slowly, so efficient use of stamina is crucial. However, there are actually two more hidden stats, Intelligence and Luck. Intelligence increases the speed and accuracy they complete the puzzle portion of the race, as well as increasing the speed at which they open the Jack in the Box. All animals and drives increase intelligence a small amount. A higher luck stat decreases both the chance for your chat to trip and the odds they'll get scared by the Jack in the Box. It's also believed to increase their chances of picking a route that avoids traps during the ending area of the Diamond and Onyx courses. 
The stat is also raised slightly by all animals and drives, but Chaos Drives increase it twice as much as animals. The Mushroom item from the Black Market also increases luck. If I had to rank the stats in terms of importance, it would probably be in this order. Running is always useful. Nearly every single race has a considerable amount of traditional running on land. Stamina is also incredibly helpful, allowing you both speed boosts on demand as well as simply being necessary to complete the longer races. Swimming is probably the next most important. There's a considerable amount of swimming sections in the races. More swimming than flying or climbing, that's for sure. A good swim stat can help compensate a lot, assuming the race has a water section, of course. Similarly, there aren't that many flying sections, but when they do happen, they can be a great opportunity to get ahead. Power, I just really can't say is terribly important, at least for racing. But there are a few power-oriented races, so it's not like you can or should completely neglect it. Luck and intelligence are both fine, but I mean, you can't see them in-game, and there's not really much you can do to go out of your way to specifically focus on them. I guess luck is a little more important, since you're always at risk of tripping when you're running, and it's very, very annoying when you lose a race you otherwise would have won because of it. Whereas intelligence only affects two very specific puzzles, which aren't even in most races. Okay, so now that you understand what the stats are, let's talk about how to raise them. As stated, you need to bring the Chow an Animal or Chaos Drive. Let's start with the Chaos Drives, because they're simpler. These drop from the Gun Robot in Sonic Adventure 2, opposed to Eggman's robot which drop little animals in a nice little piece of lore consistency. There are four different colors, each one correlating to one of the four main stats. The color Drive drops when you destroy an enemy is random. In the Dreamcast games, giving a Chow a driver animal would directly increase its status set amount. In the later games, it doesn't quite work that way. Giving a driver animal to a Chow will not directly raise its stat number, instead it increases the Chow's progress bar. Once you fill up a Chow's progress bar, it will level up, and the stat will increase a random amount determined by its stat grade. Chaos Drives increase the progress bar 24%. The progress bar is actually a percentage-based system, but the game displays as 10 little rectangles, which round to the nearest 10%. For example, anything between 15% and 24% would just show up as two filled squares. It should be noted that this helpful little stat window that pops up when you pick up a Chow was introduced in Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, but the Dreamcast games the only way to see their stats was with the VMU. So as stated earlier, they're not like Tamagotchis in the sense you have to feed them for them to survive. The fruit is simply for raising stamina. Technically you could have a Chow for its entire lifespan and never feed it once, but uh, who wouldn't be very happy about it? Plus they'll eat on their own if you leave fruit near them. But they're not going to die from you forgetting to feed them or anything like that. In fact, the only way for these guys to die is simply old age. Yep, it doesn't matter how much you starve these guys, kick them around, smash them into walls, dunk them into the dirt. We could bash these guys all day long and they never die. Yep, all day long. Well actually, there's something kind of interesting about the Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure 1. You see, it's the only game that has a different stat system than the one I described earlier. There's no intelligence, luck, or even stamina stat. Instead, there's simply the four main stats and another stat called HP. And unlike these games, your attacks do decrease this stat. And when this stat reaches zero, the Chow dies. So, you do know what this means, right? Alright, so step one is you're going to want to crack that sucker open like you're making an omelet. You can do a short hop throw here to save a few frames if you want. The next thing you're going to want to do is back that little sucker up into a corner and go to town with the spin dash. I mean, really nail the little bastard. But remember, it's not about spamming it as fast as you can, it's about consistency and rhythm, hitting him as soon as he's vulnerable again. Now he's going to want to try and crawl away to avoid being killed by you, but just keep on top of him with that spin dash and make sure you keep track of where he is with the camera, because he can go flying all over the place. Ooh, we don't like that! If you're having trouble keeping control of your spin dash, you can always try picking him up and throwing him, although this method is slightly slower. And there you go, that's my Chow Murder% percent Run Tutorial. I'm currently the only runner of this category, but I hope to inspire others to take up the challenge with this video. I understand that some people really don't like seeing Chow abuse. If you found the footage of me violently murdering that innocent baby Chow as a joke to be offensive, then you can jump to the following timecode to skip it. Hey, don't get mad at me for telling you about it. Get mad at Sonic Team for putting it in the game. And yes, I understand the real Chow murder percent category would probably have to be timed from the start of the game. This was more of a proof of concept than a real run. Alright, enough digital infanticide, let's discuss the Chow life cycle in a little more depth. Each Chow is born from their egg, lives in a child phase for about one Chow year, which is 3 hours and 12 minutes long, assuming your game is running at 60 FPS, then enters a cocoon and evolves into an adult Chow. We'll talk more about this evolution in a minute. For now, let's take a look at Chow death. A Chow's life lasts for about 5 years, after which it will enter a second cocoon. If you are neglectful or abusive to your Chow, it will actually die, disappearing forever. 
However, if it had a high enough happiness stat, it will instead enter a pink cocoon and reincarnate as an egg. Luckily, happiness is pretty easy to raise, so this isn't really that difficult to achieve. Just give them a lengthy head massage. Back in the Dreamcast era, all cocoons were the same color, so it was a little more suspenseful. Now you know what's going to happen as soon as the cocoon forms. Upon reincarnating, your chow will keep the same name and 10% of their total stats. Interestingly, a chow from a new egg will be born at level 0, but a reincarnated chow will hatch at level 1. So what's the deal with the first cocoon? Well, once a chow has reached a certain age, it's ready to transform into an adult chow. There are five different types of adult chow. Swim, fly, run, power, and normal. In addition to changing appearance, when a chow evolves, its stat grade and the corresponding stat will increase one letter rank, unless it's already the maximum rank of S. If your chow evolves into the normal type, its stamina grade will increase. During this first evolution is the only time a chow can ever increase its stat grade. So if you want your chow to have all S ranks, you're going to have to go through the laborious process of raising it, evolving it, and having it die and reincarnate over and over again. Which is why the more common method of getting a chow with all S ranks is by breeding, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. So what determines which evolution the chow will undergo? I mean, it's just whichever stat is highest, right? Well, no, it's not that simple. It has to do with your chow's stat influence, which is independent from its level and actual stat number. It's essentially just two sliders the run power slider, and the swim fly slider, which can be represented as a graph. You see, these stat types are diametrically opposed. As you give your chow run drives in animals, its power influence decreases, and vice versa. Same goes for swimming and flying. If you give your chow a thousand green drives to make him a little speed demon, then 80 red drives, it will evolve into a power type despite run being a much higher stat, as that's the stat with the highest influence at the time of evolution. If you want your chow to evolve into a normal type, then you have to balance it so none of the four stats has too much influence. It takes about 20 animals or 40 chaos drives to max the stat influence out from the neutral position. But what if the influence values are exactly the same? In the case where the swim, fly, and the run power sliders have equal absolute values, which can easily happen if you max out both influence stats, then we have to take a look at stat dominance to determine what the evolution's outcome will be. The hierarchy goes swim, power or run, and then flying. Stat influence continues to play a role in the life of an adult chow. You can continue to further affect the appearance of the adult chow by giving them animals and drives. This is informally known as the second evolution. There's no cocoon for this evolution, it merely refers to the natural growth of an adult chow over time as it receives stat influence. This is the Chow Island 3D Chow Viewer. It's a program written by justin 11 d and while not absolutely 100% game accurate, it's very, very close and an incredibly useful tool if you want to design a chow. I love messing around with this program, but I just want to use it here to demonstrate the effects that stat influence can have on a chow. Something interesting is that stat influence does not immediately have any effect on an adult chow. Like if you immediately shove 100 chaos drives in his face the second he emerges from his first evolution, he won't immediately change shape. It's only as time passes that you begin to see the effects. Even if you don't give them any drives or animals, adult chow will still change over time. Although the effect can be quite subtle as seen in the normal chow. For example, this is a newly evolved run chow. So as the running chow gets older, he begins to turn more blue, and his little head nubbins come up to form ears. It's clear that this is obviously becoming a little Sonic chow. That's cute. It doesn't make sense that the run chow would look like Sonic. If we were to continue giving it lots of run drives and animals and max out his stat influence in it, you'll see that it becomes even bluer and more Sonic-like. This is what the second evolution refers to, so this would be called a Run Run Chow. But unlike the first evolution, this is not a permanent change. If you were to then max him out on power via drives, his appearance would change to this, and he would be known as a Run Power Chow. Again, the further into an adult Chow's lifespan, the more prominently the effects of stat influence are displayed. Another cute little detail is the fly type chow looks similar to knights, and indeed if you make a fly fly type chow it makes the effect even more pronounced. Anyways, I know it might seem like I'm over explaining this a tad bit, I just want to make it very clear how many different possible ways you can get your chow to look. It's very customizable and easy to make a fairly unique looking chow. Speaking of customizing your chow, it's finally time to talk about animals. Animals are the other thing you can give your chow to boost their stats besides chaos drives, and indeed animals came first as the drives weren't introduced until Sonic Adventure 2. It's always been a serious tradition to have little animals inside Eggman's robots that pop out when Sonic destroys them, and it's kinda nice they progress this aspect of the series by giving them an actual gameplay use now. The reason I chose to talk about chaos drives first is I wanted to keep things simple when explaining stats and evolutions and all that jazz, 
But the truth is your chow aren't gonna look like this. They're gonna look like this! You see, when you give an animal to a chow, not only does it increase their stats, but the chow also receives a physical attribute from the animal. Each animal will have a number of different possible attributes it could give. For example, if you give a chow a penguin, there's a chance it'll replace the chow's feet or arms, or it could give the chow big ass penguin eyebrows. The body part you get will be randomized, which can be a bit of a pain in the ass if you're trying to give your chow a certain specific combination of animal parts. It should be mentioned that the pool of animals is slightly different between Sonic Adventure 1 and 2. There's some overlap, but each game has a few creatures unique to it. Sonic Adventure 2 more so, as it has a greater total number of animals. As you may have noticed, the portraits have a colored background. As I'm sure you can guess, yellow, purple, green, and red backgrounds all correspond to their stat type, as evident from the kinds of animals themselves. Birds for flying, strong animals for power, etc. There are several key differences between Chaos Drives and animals. The first of which is that animals can and usually do affect all four bars instead of just one. Another major difference is they can actually decrease a progress bar. An animal can never lower stats or remove levels, all it can do is slightly decrease one of your progress bars, and there's no effect if the bar is already at zero. Animals are typically much more efficient and faster way to level compared to Chaos Drives, as long as you're using them intelligently. Like look at the Otter for instance. He increases Swim 44% compared to the 24% of a Yellow Chaos Drive, and on top of that he even increases Run 8% too. The downside is he decreases Fly by 4% and Power by 16%. So it increases progress bars by 52% total, but it also comes with a decrease of 20% for a net total gain of 32%. Again, that already alone makes it better than the Chaos Drives, but if you can get a shitload of Otters, then once your Power and Fly progress bars hit zero, they can't go any lower, so every Otter you're getting the full 52% stat bonus without any downsides. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bunch of the exact same animal either. Just pay attention to which bars are getting downgraded and make sure the animals you're giving your chow have stat boost synergy. Some animals only decrease one progress bar instead of two, and some don't decrease any at all. These are the most valuable animals, and they're the ones without a stat colored background. In Sonic Adventure 1 there was just the blue background animals, known as the random type. They increase every stat group and don't decrease any. Sonic Adventure 2 also has these animals, but it introduced two additional types of rare animals, Mythical and Ghost. These are even better than the random type on average, but they're harder to obtain. Because animals are just so much better than using the Chaos Drives for raising stats, you basically have no choice but to use them. And like I said, actively curating your Chow's appearance can be an annoying degree of micromanagement when you're just trying to get your stats up, so most of the time your Chow is just gonna have to look like this. Or this or just some other ungodly combination of animal parts. You're basically always going to be maintaining a balancing act between leveling up your chow and making them not look like shit. The only time you can really totally stop worrying about this is once you've reached max level and can no longer improve its stats, then you can focus entirely on the appearance. But by that time they're probably near the end of their lifespan and ready to reincarnate and start the process all over again. God, you're an ugly little bastard. Here, put this on. Yeah, that's much better. So yeah, it turns out the true utility of Chaos Drives is that they don't turn your Chow into a freaky little monster. In Sonic Adventure 1, nearly every enemy in the game contains an animal. Each stage has a pool of five different animals you can find inside enemies, which change depending on the level. In Sonic Adventure 2, Chaos Drives are more common to find in enemies than animals. However, each stage will have hidden animals scattered throughout it. There are 10 in treasure hunting stages, 15 in mech stages, and 20 in running stages, and collecting them all will even grant you an extra life. In addition to these hidden animals, you can also find bonus animals in the second and third Chow Key containers once you've obtained a key from the first one. The second one will contain an assortment of that stage's animals, and the third one will contain a mythical or ghost animal. Chow don't just inherit body parts from animals, they also gain abilities. For each animal, there's an associated action with it that the Chow learns once they've received it, and they will remember how to do it for the rest of their life regardless of whether or not the animal part gets overwritten. Some are pretty obvious. For example, if you give a chow a gorilla, it will occasionally beat its chest. A penguin causes it to slide on its stomach. I'm not going to go over every single one, but some of them are pretty amusing. In Sonic Adventure 1, giving the lion to your chow teaches it how to break dance for some reason, and the sheep causes it to do somersaults, and the skunk will make it fart. Wonderful. The dragon even lets it breathe fire. Some of the effects are a little more drastic, particularly with the three ghost-type animals. Giving the chow a bat will remove its legs, making it float around like a little ghosty. And the half-fish animal, which I'm pretty sure is actually just a kappa, replaces your chow's emotion ball with a little flame. That's pretty neat. Let's say you don't like the way your chow looks. 
Maybe you just want his legs or motion ball to come back or something. Or you just want to remove all the weird animal tumors that have grown all over its body. Well, if you're playing Sonic Adventure 1 or DX, you can't. You're shit out of luck. However, there is a way to remove animal parts in Sonic Adventure 2. But how, you might wonder? Is there something you can do at the kindergarten maybe? Talk to a doctor or get an item from the black market? Nope. The way you remove animal parts is with the third ghost animal, the skeleton dog. Each skeleton dog you give your chow will, instead of adding a new body part, actually remove an animal feature at random. As stated earlier, the skeleton dogs are a ghost animal which are much rarer than normal stage animals, which is, shall we say, less than convenient. Luckily, due to something I'll be discussing shortly, this is really not a deal breaker or major issue, just a questionable design choice. So as I alluded to earlier with my hilarious paper bag joke, you can give your chow hats to wear which cover up their head. They can wear part of an eggshell as a hat, or if you're playing as Knuckles or Rouge, you can dig up a pumpkin or skull hat for them to wear. But most of the hats can simply be bought from the black market. But if you just go get a hat and give it to your chow, he's just going to look confused and throw it away. It doesn't matter how many times you shove it in that little bastard's hands, he will refuse to put it on. You see, this is because Chow are not born with the ability to wear hats. So, how do you unlock it? What weird solution is it this time? Well, in order to give your Chow the ability to wear a hat, you need to give it a skeleton dog. Yep, in addition to removing body parts, once your Chow has been given its first skeleton dog, you permanently gain the ability to wear hats. There isn't any sort of visual indication or notification that your child can now wear hats, nor does it mention this anywhere in the game to my knowledge, especially not that useless fucking principle. Oh, and in Sonic Adventure DX there were no ghost dogs, so they had to give this property to the koala. In the original Sonic Adventure 1 there simply were no hats. Oh, after all that you want to take the hat off, huh? Well, I'm afraid there's only one way. <laughs> it's okay. This is mandatory abuse. It's for his own good. So here's the rub. Raising a chow takes way, way, way too fucking long. Like if you just try to raise a good chow by stopping in between levels as you play through the game normally, it will take you a very, very long time and quite a lot of playthroughs. Realistically, at some point you will end up being forced to grind over and over for animals, which is incredibly tedious. I really just think they should have balanced it slightly more leniently. Like I understand the whole point of the chow garden was to increase play time and making you replay stages was part of that. But raising just one chow feels like it takes an eternity, let alone trying to do multiple at once. However, by a stroke of luck, a glitch was discovered that seems to be an exact solution to this problem. The infinite small animal use glitch is probably the single most famous glitch in the entire game. Usually once you give a chow an animal or drive, it will grab it, embrace it, and then release it in a shower of sparkles, after which you're no longer able to interact with it, and it disappears shortly thereafter. However, there is a very small area where if you put down the animal right in front of the chow, close but not too close, the chow will absorb the animal and gain the sets, but you'll still be able to pick it up and use it again. It can be a little tricky to figure out the sweet spot at first, but eventually you'll get a feel for it. It helps having a few animals near you so you can chain them together to keep the chow from wandering off. This works with chaos drives as well, however they go flying much further so it's harder to pull off consistently or to get into a good rhythm. This glitch spread across the internet chow community like wildfire, and honestly, it's not even that hard to discover for yourself. This is basically the glitch that saved the chow garden. I honestly believe there would have been substantially less people who got really into the chow garden if it wasn't for this glitch. Also, like I stated earlier, with this glitch you only need one skeleton dog to remove all the animal parts in a chow, which makes that process much less tedious. Hmm, so that's pretty much all the basics covered, right? Am I forgetting anything? Oh yeah, just one of the most fundamental and iconic features of the chow garden, which was introduced in Sonic Adventure 2. Alignment. Luckily for me, alignment is a surprisingly simple feature, all things considered. It's basically just a slider that goes from hero to dark. When the Chow is still in its child form, its appearance isn't just affected by its stat influence, it's also affected by its alignment slider. If you're kind to a Chow as a hero character by petting it, feeding it, etc., you will increase its hero alignment, and you can watch the effects of this happen in real time if you just pet the shit out of one for long enough. However, if you were to abuse the Chow as a hero character, its alignment will shift the other way towards dark. For dark characters, it's the opposite. Be kind to them to make them dark, and abuse them to make them hero. But really, there's no reason to do it like this. It's much slower than just petting them a bunch with the alignment you want. And moreover than that, it's just cruel. If you're one of those psychos out there who's running around bashing your chow into rocks, and just kicking them, and smacking them around, and just beating the shit out of them, then shame on you. These little blue footballs deserve to be treated with respect. You might be wondering, how does this work in Sonic Adventure DX, as that game isn't split into hero and dark characters, well, it actually is possible to change a chow's alignment, but it is an extremely slow and tedious process of feeding them hero fruit or dark fruit. This is just one of the many reasons why Sonic Adventure 2 Battle is the preferred game for raising chow. 
When a child Chao with a strong hero alignment undergoes its first evolution, it will become a hero Chao. And it works the same way for the dark Chao. So earlier when I was saying this is a run run Chao and this is a fly fly Chao, that wasn't entirely accurate. The full nomenclature here would be a neutral run run Chao and a neutral fly fly Chao. So these are just the standard hero normal normal and dark normal normal Chao. They're affected by stat influence just the same as a neutral Chao, so you can have a dark fly power or a hero swim fly, etc, etc. And yes, if you were wondering, dark run run looks like a little shadow. Remember the Chao evolution chart I showed earlier? Well, there are actually three times as many types. There really are a ton of different ways a Chao can look, and this is before even putting on animal parts or other cosmetics. Anyways, once a Chao has reached its adult phase, its alignment is essentially locked in. The game still technically keeps track of their alignment as adults, but it doesn't affect their appearance at all, and only has the most minute imaginable behavioral effect. If your Chao has a high enough bond with a character, then when it greets you it has a chance to give a bow if it's hero aligned, or a thumbs up if it's dark aligned. I think that's literally the only effect it has in adulthood. Once you've evolved a hero and dark Chao, you'll gain access to the hero and dark gardens, respectively. Sonic Adventure 1 also has three gardens to choose from, one for Station Square, Mystic Ruins, and the Egg Carrier. All gardens across both games can only hold up to 8 Chao each. The Hero and Dark Gardens actually do slowly affect the Chao's alignment over time. Just being in the Dark Garden for about 2 hours with no player input is enough to influence a Child Chao enough to become a Dark Chao when they evolve. As you can see, all the gardens underwent some changes between the Dreamcast and GameCube versions, although some of them only had extremely minor changes. The funniest change is they had to lower the water level in the Hero Garden because in the Dreamcast version you could drown Tails in it. I always thought it was so weird that this version of the mechless Tails can even die, like you literally never use him in an adventure stage, just in the Chow Garden. To me the most baffling change will always be the removal of this cool hill and little hidden cave area in the Dark Garden. I guess they just wanted to keep it flat and straightforward so you wouldn't lose your Chow or whatever, but it's kind of a bummer. If you ever spend a lot of the time in the Hero or Dark Gardens, you might notice your Chow never seemed to use half the garden. You can pick them up and put them there, but they'll never walk there of their own free will. This is due to the waypoint structure of the Chao's movement AI. This entire part of both gardens is simply missing waypoints altogether. Thankfully you can download a mod to fix this issue on PC. What if I told you there was actually a sixth type of Chao you could evolve into? There's nowhere in the game that explains how to do this, and even online for the longest time, people didn't understand the exact mechanics of it. There are a number of requirements you need to meet. First of all, your Chao needs to have reincarnated at least twice already. The second is it needs a happiness value of greater than 80. Again, this is easy to achieve. The third, and most important, is it needs to have been given at least one of every animal in its current life. For the longest time, people thought you must only give your Chao exactly one of each animal, but that's not the case. All that matters is to make sure it evolves into a normal type Chao, meaning none of its four stat influences are high enough to cause it to evolve into a Chao of that specific type. When you finally complete all of these steps correctly, then upon evolving, a special music sting will play, and your Chao will have evolved into the legendary Chaos Chao. This is a very special kind of Chao. It cannot receive animal parts like a regular Chao, and will always maintain a single featureless appearance that does not change regardless of stat influence. Chaos Chao are incapable of mating, so if you want another Chaos Chao, you need to go through all the steps listed earlier. And finally, their signature ability is that they're immortal. They will never die or reincarnate. In addition to your standard Chaos Chow, there's also the Hero and Dark versions, sometimes informally referred to as Angel Chow and Devil Chow. This is essentially considered the pinnacle of Chow evolution. But as it is locked into this form and unable to reincarnate, its stat grades will never be able to be improved, and its final stats at level 99 will be what it's stuck with forever. So if you're going to go through the trouble of raising a Chaos Chow, obviously make sure it's not some E-ranked piece of shit. Now I'm not 100% sure what the lore implications of this are. I mean, we already knew Chaos was connected to the Chao as their guardian or whatever. I guess this is implying Chaos has evolved from a Chao, or what? In the original Japanese release of Sonic Adventure 1, Chaos can be heard making Chao sounds when appearing and transforming into Call's flashback during the last story. <laughs> For whatever reason, these Chao sounds were removed in later versions. Well, according to the official Chaos character page on Sonic Channel, he is, in fact, a mutated Chao after all, so let's just leave it at that. So, what do you do if you want more Chao? Well, the main way to get more Chao is by breeding them. 
After about three chow years, an adult chow will naturally enter a mating phase. Or you can use a heart fruit from the black market in order to cause any adult chow to immediately start its mating season. Once you have any two chow who are ready to mate, put them next to each other and they'll rub their little faces together and an egg pops out. It's really that simple. Chow are not gendered and there's no such thing as chow incest, or, well, at least there's no negative consequences from it. In Sonic Adventure 1, there are also three hidden chow eggs you can find in the adventure field. A gold one, a silver one, and a black one. Then, through breeding these rare chow together, you can hatch the bronze and onyx chow as well. In the Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure 1, these were the only different color chow you could get besides the default. In fact, these three eggs were the only eggs you can get in the entire game besides the ones you get from breeding, so I think that means if you were to kill the two starting chow from each of the three gardens, then find all three eggs in the adventure fields and kill those chow too, you'd be permanently stuck without a way to get new chow, right? Every other version has a black market you can buy new eggs from, but not the original Sonic Adventure 1, so I think that makes it the only game you can achieve total chow extinction. Not that I'd ever do such a thing, of course, but I'm just saying some depraved madman out there or some stupid poor kid who just sucks at raising chow has probably done it. Sonic Adventure 2 for the Dreamcast, in addition to introducing the hero in Dark Chow, also brought back the black, silver, and gold chow from the first game. However, as there were no adventure fields to find the eggs in, this is when they had the idea to create the Chow Black Market. However, it's quite different in this game compared to the later iterations. It was only accessible online via the in-game web browser. You see this bulletin board? In the PC version, it just displays this not-so-helpful message, but in the Dreamcast version, it offers to launch the website. The GameCube version simply referred you to the URL. This version of the Black Market didn't charge rings, but rather required you to have a certain amount of emblems earned. This was verified by uploading your save file to the web page. Players were able to download a number of rare jewel chow, like the Ruby, Sapphire, Amethyst, and Emerald Chow. The final Chow available from the site was the incredibly rare Moon Chow. This Chow is completely unique in that it's the only Chow available in any of the games which uses a specific texture for its skin, and it was only available in the Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure 2. Despite this, you only need 30 emblems to be allowed to download it, which is a pretty low number all things considered. In addition to the black market, there was also a section called the Chow Daycare where you could upload your Chow for other people to download, and you could browse other people's Chow creations too. Anyways, with the GameCube games, they introduced 13 different colored Chow eggs available from the black market. In general, as you collect more emblems in the main game, the variety of items in the black market increases. However, you might find that even with all the emblems, no matter how many times you check the shop, it will never have the specific color egg you want. This is because there are three sets of colors, each containing three colors, blue, orange, and green, yellow, pink, and purple, and finally red, brown, and sky blue. When your Chow save game is generated, one of these sets is selected to never be sold at the Chow store, meaning you will never be able to obtain Chow of these colors on your save. This might seem like an odd feature, permanently making a few colors unavailable, especially on PC where there's no way to get them without hacking. But in the GameCube version, you could actually trade Chow between games using a feature I'll talk about later. So the colored Chow eggs you buy from the store can hatch a Chow that are all one solid color. These are known as Monotone Chow, and unlike normal Chow who change color with their stat influence and evolution, these Monotone Chow will maintain their solid coloration their entire life. However, this is not the only kind of Chow coloration possible. By breeding a Monotone Chow with a normal Chow, you're able to create a Two-Tone Chow, these Chow are not a solid flat color, and they can display highlights and patterns that come with certain evolutions. In addition to color and tone, there's another factor that influences a Chow's appearance, whether it's shiny or not. On rare occasions, the black market will have a shiny monotone color egg for sale. As the name implies, a shiny Chow will have a brighter, sparkling coating. All Chow can come in either shiny or non-shiny versions. However, Shiny Chow is not to be confused with a jewel coat like the gold or silver Chow from Sonic Adventure 1, or the downloadable Chow from the Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure 2. That's actually a separate thing. A jewel coat will override the natural tone and coloration of a Chow. As in, technically you could have a monotone red Chow with a gold jewel coat. It would just look identical to a normal Chow or any other color Chow with a gold coat. Via breeding, it's even possible to obtain a shiny jewel Chow. However, the shiny and jewel traits appear to conflict, and depending on the version of the game you're using, they can appear completely different. On GameCube, depending on the color used, they can appear transparent or even invisible. On the original PC release of Sonic Adventure DX, they just appear as shiny two-tones, but as a completely different color than the version you used to breed for some reason. 
For whatever reason, on the Steam, 360, and PS3 versions of the game, there's a glitch that causes the shiny Jewel Chow to appear insanely bright. So color, tone, shininess, and jewel code are the four genes that affect a Chow's appearance. When it comes to breeding, there are dominant and recessive genes. For example, all color genes are equally dominant except for the normal coloration, which is recessive. On the other hand, jewel coding is a dominant gene, with all children of a jewel code parent inheriting it. Every Chow will have two alleles stored in each genetic trait. Chow do in fact have hidden and recessive genes not expressed in their phenotype. Look, I'll spare you the Punnett squares, but basically Chow breeding is a pretty simple process, although depending on the offspring you're hoping for, it might take a few tries. So in addition to selling eggs, hats, and fruits, something else you can buy from the black market are seeds. In order to plant the seed, your Chow will need to have won the shovel toy from the crab pool race. You can also water the sapling with the watering can toy you win from the Stump Valley race in order to make it grow faster and live longer. Most fruits give a small percentage bonus to stamina per bite, but some have a special effect for the last bite. For example, it's the last bite of the heart fruit that makes the chow ready to mate, and it's the last bite of the hero and dark fruit that slightly changes their alignment. The last bite of the mushroom is what slightly increases your luck. Chow also have a favorite fruit which it prefers to eat. You see, sometimes Chow will behave and eat the whole fruit when you give it to them, and sometimes they'll take one bite and then toss it away, so you keep having to shove it in their face over and over again. So let's say your Chow's favorite fruit is the triangle fruit. You can get a triangle seed to plant in your garden and start growing them yourself instead of having to buy them individually. These planted trees will eventually die though, unlike the regular trees. Each garden has four fixed spots where seeds can be planted. Apparently in the Steam version of Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, the trees the Chow plant are broken and will never update from their sapling model, resulting in these weird looking buggy monstrosities. This is actually really bothering me, so I went online and surprisingly there's no quick and easy patch you can download to fix this. People had to resort to hex editing the game in order to change the appearance of the sapling to adult trees. Eventually, Sonic Retro user Main Memory was nice enough to post a simple text string you can add to the codes list of the Sonic Adventure 2 mod manager. So I did just that, and it's still not working. Huh. Oh, it's because I needed to capitalize the P in patch, of course. Duh. Did I really need to include this information in the video? No. No, I didn't. Something very strange that you can buy from the black market are menu themes. I'm not sure how many people even know this feature exists, but if you go into the options menu in Sonic Adventure 2, you can select a character theme, which changes the menu voiceovers to their voice as well as the background of the options menu. There's one for each playable character, as well as unlockable Omo Chow, Amy Rose, and Maria themes in the black market. They go for 10,000, 20,000, and 30,000 rings respectively, which makes the Maria theme the most expensive item in the game. They also have other requirements in order to even appear in the shop in the first place. For Omo Chow, you need 100 emblems. For Amy, you need two Chow Race emblems and all action stage emblems, apart from the all A ranks emblem. And finally, for Maria's theme to appear, you not only need all 180 emblems, you need to have linked Sonic Advance 1 and 2 to your save file via the GBA link cable. So that means it's impossible to get normally on the PC, although thankfully being on PC, of course, it's easy to fix with a mod. Something even stranger is that there's actually a hidden theme you can unlock. Go to the menu to select one, and then you have to rotate the control stick clockwise for 30 seconds, and a theme will appear for the President's Secretary. You know, this one random, extremely unimportant character? That is an extremely peculiar easter egg. Okay, so after all of that, what exactly am I supposed to do with my Chow? I mean, what, am I supposed to just sit around and look at it? Well, now we can finally play the game. I mean, sure, technically you don't need to know any of that stuff to start racing. If you want, you can just crack one of your eggs open and head into the waterfall and immediately enter into a race. It's just that he's gonna suck. The race mechanics differ slightly from Sonic Adventure 1 to Sonic Adventure 2. I'll briefly go over the SA1 system first. There are only two sets of races, beginner and jewel races, and five courses. Pearl, Amethyst, Sapphire, Ruby, and Emerald. Once you win the jewel race, your Chow gets a little race medal it wears on its chest which looks like the corresponding jewel. In this version, there is no stamina meter for your Chow, as it wasn't a stat in the original SA1. The way boosts work is randomly during the race, the camera will shift focus to a different Chow and it will start sparkling. You can then press A in order to cheer it and give it a short little burst of speed. Weirdly, you can cheer any Chow you want, not just your own. I'm personally not really a fan of this system, I just want to watch my own Chow the whole time and the camera is constantly shifting focus. Because of all this, I really do not care for doing the races in Sonic Adventure 1. 
A neat feature was the hidden rival chow that can show up once you've completed every race. If you have a chow with stats adding up to 6,751 or more, there's a chance the silver chow can appear, who have significantly higher stats than the normal challengers. If your chow is at least 1,900 in every single stat, then the gold chow can appear, or even tougher than the silver chow. However, most interesting is a mysterious black chow named Chakron. Yes, in the Dreamcast version, they could actually display names before races, and it shows up as Chaklon with an L, but it's supposed to be an R. You know how Japanese people be. He has very interesting, unique behavior. As soon as the race starts, he'll immediately lay down and go to sleep, allowing your chow to gain a huge head start. But about halfway through the race, he'll wake up and start running, revealing he has incredibly high stats. Even with such a late start, he'll often overtake you and win if your stats aren't high enough. Oh yeah, something else interesting in the Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure 1 is you can actually walk around this room, it isn't just a menu screen. And you can clearly see these little Omo Chow statues. I guess I'm not sure if this technically counts as his first appearance, as he's not named and he doesn't speak or anything, but I mean, that's his character model right there. I guess they decided to repurpose it for the next game. So in Sonic Adventure 2, there are actually six categories of races. The standard beginner and jewel, hero and dark, the special challenge races, and party race mode which allows you to race your own chow against each other. In the Dreamcast games, you could have eight of your chow racing simultaneously, whereas in the GameCube games up to four chow can race at once, one for each controller. In the PC versions, you're only allowed to race two of your chow at a time for some reason. In both games, there's actually only one map which has every single chow race. It's the specific route that changes depending on which race you're doing. Different routes test different stats. For example, the Aquamarine course is focused on the swim stat with a lengthy water section. Each category of race not only has different routes, but different difficulty levels as well. The beginner races have three levels of difficulty per track, and once you beat them, you get a little medal on your chow and unlock the jewel races. These races are much longer and have five difficulty levels per set. Upon winning the fifth and highest level, your chow will receive a medal of the corresponding jewel. In addition to swag, medals, and jewels, Chow can also win toys from breeding Chow races, such as the Pogo Stick and Sonic Doll. Most of these toys are just something that Chow will pull out and play with when it has nothing to do. However, a few toys you win are not specific to an individual Chow, but are instead items that show up in the garden like the ball, the radio, the jack-in-the-box, the rocking horse, and the television. Once you evolve a hero or dark Chow, you unlock their respective set of races, just four each. Oddly, you don't have to be a hero chow to enter the hero race, you're just not allowed to be a dark chow and vice versa. So you can beat every race in the game with a high level neutral chow if you want. The hero races are against dark chow and the aesthetic of the course has been changed to a spooky version to match the tone. Again, the opposite is true for the dark races. It's against hero chow and a more angelic looking version of the stage. The final challenge in both sets is a one-on-one -on -one race against a chaos chow of the opposite alignment. Winning this race also grants your Chow a hero or dark themed medal. The final and most interesting set of races is the challenge races, a set of 12 uniquely themed races against very challenging opponents. The first two races are actually a callback to Sonic Adventure 1's Chow races. The first is against gold and silver rivals, and the second features the return of Chakron. Unfortunately, he lacks his trademark sleeping behavior, but at least he retains his super high stats. The third and fourth races are interesting. In the third race, you're up against a bunch of Omo Chows, and in the fourth, you're up against a bunch of small animals. Technically, these are all just reskin Chows, so it's not that different from a gameplay perspective, but they are pretty difficult opponents. The fifth race is against so called Cockroach Chow, Black Chow with Little Antenna. The next race is another one with reskin Chow, this time against Little Egg Chow. Next race is against Skull Chow in the Spooky Garden, followed by a very similar race against Pumpkin Head Chow. This is followed by yet another spooky race, but against Ghost Chow with no legs and the flame balls. The tenth race is a rematch against an even stronger Chakron. And the penultimate challenge race is against a group of colorful dual Chow called the Chow Rangers. The final challenge race, called Here Comes the Ultimate Rival, is a one-on-one -on -one race against a neutral Chaos Chow with extremely high stats. Upon beating this race, your Chow will get the gold medal. Now, there's a number of minutia I could get into here like the time my chow tripped, then immediately tripped again, or that time it fell into the hole at the end of the race, and then it tripped in the hole, or that time I was doing the puzzle section, and this fucking guy just comes up and skips it. Like what the hell, this old bastard is cheating. I have done a shitload of races for this video, and this was the only time I ever saw a chow flat out skip the puzzle section. The hell is that about? 
But let's just move on to discuss Chow Karate, a feature only in Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. In this mode, two Chow fight each other. You can either enter in a tournament against five progressively stronger computer Chow, or you can choose to fight any two of your own Chow. On the GameCube, the interleague match option allowed you to battle Chow from two different memory cards, so you can take your memory card to your friend's house and watch your Chow fight against each other, which is pretty cool. In this mode, you do not directly control the Chow, rather you merely observe them as they fight. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see your Chow's zeal meter. It will gradually decrease over the course of the battle, with chunks coming off if your Chow gets hit or misses an attack. Once the zeal meter hits zero, your Chow will sit on its ass and you need to mash that A button like there's no tomorrow to cheer it on and restore as much zeal as fast as you can before your opponent gets a free hit in. For whatever reason, they decided the cheering noise had to be the most annoying sound in the world. There are three ways to win a Chow Karate match. The first is simply attack the opponent until their health bar is depleted, of course. And the second is by knocking them out of the ring. The third is simply to have more health remaining once the 90 second time limit is up. It's possible to tie, but it's pretty rare. You might be wondering how stats work in this mode. Well, in this mode they do different things. Swim is the defense stat, which lowers the damage you take from enemy attacks. Fly is stealth, which increases your evasion, making your chow more likely to dodge. Run is speed, which increases your chow's attack speed, a very useful and important skill. It's in this mode that the power stat truly shines. It's not terribly useful in races, but as you might expect in this mode, it directly increases your Chow's attack power, meaning your attacks do more damage and it sends them flying back further. In addition to this, as your power stat increases, your Chow can learn new attacks like the spin kick. Stamina, of course, simply affects the size of your Chow's health bar, as well as reduces the amount of zeal lost when attacked. Intelligence and luck are both related to zeal, decreasing the rate at which it drains and increasing the rate at which you recover it, respectively. There are four different levels of karate to select. Once you beat expert mode, you unlock the super tournament. Each is a series of five battles against the computer. Certain rounds will have alternate opponents you can occasionally face instead. The final fight of the super tournament is against an onyx neutral chaos chow called Flash. Defeat him and your chow will achieve the rank of grandmaster. Now it's time to discuss what might be the biggest difference between the console versions and the PC versions of the adventure games. They completely lack any sort of handheld cross compatibility. In each garden there's this machine. On Dreamcast it's to send the Chow to the VMU, while on the GameCube it's to transfer them to the Game Boy Advance. The VMU machine has different designs for the hero in Dark Gardens, which is a nice touch, whereas there's just one GBA machine. Since there's no tiny Chow garden on PC, in Sonic Adventure DX it's known as the Chow Name Machine, since there's no kindergarten in this game where you name your Chow. In Sonic Adventure 2, however, it's literally just the Chow garbage can. Getting rid of unwanted Chow is the only remaining feature of this thing, so now it has the extremely ominous title of the Chow Departure Machine. To get rid of a Chow, you can chuck it in this thing and select the Goodbye option. The music changes to this incredibly melodramatic sad song, and it reads, Chow will have a happy life in a faraway forest. You will never see your Chow again. Oh my god, that's... that's so sad. That's the saddest thing I've ever seen. Psych! Just kidding, I don't give a fuck. Get the fuck out of here, you little bitch! Nah, I'm just kidding. I won't really get rid of you. Yet. Originally in the Dreamcast games, an integral part of the chat raising experience was putting it in the VMU to interact with it. In addition to just raising your little chow while playing the main game, you could even take it around with you. In fact, quite a lot of important functionality was locked behind this feature, such as the ability to see their stats and mood, and it was crucial for raising your chow's stats quickly. There were also unique items you could obtain which had special effects when taken back to the main garden. Sonic Adventure 2 had its own version, Chow Adventure 2, which was a little different but the same basic idea. In the Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure 2, the only way to raise luck and intelligence was with the VMU minigame. Something interesting is that you can actually connect VMUs together and have the Chow interact. There was a little fighting mode where you could make the two Chow fight, and there was even a breeding option where you could link Chow together giving you both an egg. VMU breeding is actually superior to regular garden breeding, giving a Chow that starts with 10% of the stats of its parents averaged together. For the GameCube games, this feature was completely revamped and overhauled, as obviously it would be very difficult to play Chow Adventure on a GameCube memory card. 
Instead, they introduced the Tiny Chow Garden, a feature that was designed to take advantage of the GBA link cable. The Tiny Chow Garden is a simple 2D Chow Garden that was included in Sonic Advance 1 and 2, as well as Sonic Pinball Party. If you didn't own any of these games, they actually gave you the option to download a temporary copy of Tiny Chow Garden to your GBA, which you can use until you turn the system off, either just to mess around with it or in order to transfer Chow between games. The Tiny Chow Garden essentially works like a simplified version of the main Chow Garden, unlike Chow Adventure 1 and 2 are essentially just little mini-games. Time does not pass in this garden so your Chow won't grow old or die. It can hold one Chow and one egg at a time. A Chow's appearance in the Tiny Chow Garden doesn't necessarily reflect their actual coloration or evolution from the main game, but other than that it pretty much works how you'd expect. You can pet them, you can feed them fruit, give them toys to play with, etc. However, there's one critical feature missing from the Tiny Chow Garden. There's simply no way to abuse the Chow. However, if you completely neglect them for long enough, they can actually run away. It even has its own shop, which happens to be the only way you can acquire Jewel Chow in Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. The currency used in this shop is the rings from the Advanced Games or Pinball Party. However, you can also earn rings from one of the two included mini-games. The first game, which is in every version, is Chow Memory, a simple matching game. However, the second minigame depends on the version you're playing. In Advance 1, in the downloadable garden from Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, the game will be Rock, Paper, Scissors, and in Sonic Advance 2, it's Chow Bounce, and in Sonic Pinball Party, it's Chow Ball. Only in the temporary downloadable garden from Sonic Adventure DX can you play Chow Search. This game even has the official sprite work of Tikal. Something else you might notice is that- what the, what the fuck? So apparently Chow can talk. I mean, I guess I already knew Chow could talk, like the Chow Doctor and Principal, but I didn't think my Chow could talk. In the main garden they just make baby noises, but transfer them in here and they just start chatting away. And it's not just that. It's not just that they talk, but they say the weirdest things. I mean, some of the things they say are pretty normal, like, I'm hungry, or how was your day, or just like gameplay tips or whatever. But some of these are just bizarre. Chow! I love screaming chow! When I see nuts, I go nuts. I can't breathe underwater. I tried. My young carefree days are gone. Dude, you're like 15 minutes old. Chill out! Sometimes I wonder if my career is going anywhere. I want to be 30,000 meters tall. Get a new battery or I'm a goner. Well, that's a little morbid. Oh no, split ends, my poor hair. But, but you're bald. If I had shorter legs, I could be a model. What the hell are you talking about? How could your legs literally get any shorter? Your feet are practically connected to your torso. What is politics? Should I care? What is political reform? Is it tasty? What? Maybe I should conquer the world. Okay, that's, uh, that's enough on the tiny chow garden. What if I told you there was one final special type of chow? known as Character Chow. Unlike the Sonic, Shadow, and Nice Chow, which are natural stat-based evolutions, these are three completely unique Chow, specially edited to look like one of three characters, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy. But there is no way to unlock these Chow on your own through the natural course of playing the game. You see, these Chow are actually distributed at special events in Japan, like the 2001 World Hobby Fair. There aren't a whole lot of pictures of these events, unfortunately. And for a long time, this was thought to be the only way they were officially distributed. However, users of the Chow Island forum, specifically Per and X Pop, eventually discovered there was another way Japanese players could obtain them. This is the Nintendo GameCube 2003 eSoft Catalog. As the title implies, it's an electronic software catalog, and has 116 titles listed. It also contained a few demos, one of which was Sonic Adventure DX. On the demo menu, one of the options has a little Chow icon. The text translates to Joy Carry, which was a term used for downloading minigames to the GBA from the GameCube. Selecting the tab shows off a number of minigames including Puyo Puyo, Choo Choo Rocket, and Tiny Chow Garden. Picking this option allows you to choose one of three character Chow to put in the game. Here we can see the screen shown in a lot of the live event photos. When you transfer the Chow over to Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, it also gives you a thousand rings for whatever reason. A forum user named Air Conditioner managed to track down one of these discs and even made an ISO image of it and put it online, so you can try it yourself if you want. You know, if you really want an unofficial, official character Chow. Anyways, these Chow are immortal and cannot breed like the Chaos Chow, 
and nothing can change their appearance like animal parts. They start with 250 in all stats at level 1, all A ranks, and maximum intelligence and luck. For whatever bizarre reason, the Knuckles Chow is unable to participate in the dark races, and the Amy Chow is unable to participate in the light races. Amy's secretly a dark character confirmed? Or, and this is pure speculation on my part, like I implied earlier, they're probably just copied and pasted from the Chaos Chow and they just changed some values around, because otherwise they're nearly identical on a gameplay level. But alas, this was all Japanese only, unfortunately. There was no way to obtain any of these character Chow in North America. Well, actually, there is a legitimate way to unlock the Tails Chow, but the method is unbelievably esoteric. Step 1. Turn off the game. Step 2. Pop in your copy of Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2. Once you've completed the first three quests, you'll unlock an offline mode only quest called The Fake in Yellow. If you've already completed this quest, you'll need to either finish every single quest to be able to replay it again, or try again on another difficulty setting. The quest objective is to find Dr. Gulls. It's a fairly straightforward mission. Just complete the level and talk to the friendly Ragrappy and it'll agree to return home. A telepipe to Pioneer 2 will appear. Take it back, but do not finish the mission. Instead, immediately return through the telepipe. Once you're back, you have to find a specific area and face it. Eventually a Chow will appear and talk to you and give you a key item. It even plays a little song from Samba de Amigo. There will now be a Game Boy Advance machine sitting outside of the Hunter's Guild. Activate it and connect your GBA to download the Tiny Chow Garden. This version of the garden comes with the Tails Chow. Now turn off Fantasy Star Online and put in Sonic Adventure 2 Battle again and transfer him over. And that is the only official way to get a Tails Chow in this region. I should mention this was far from the only crossover they had with Sonic, so it's not like this was totally out of the blue or anything, but it's still a pretty obscure method. With the way stats affect a Chow's appearance, sometimes I wonder what it would be like if you could maximize run and power, or swim and fly, but as stated this is fundamentally impossible on a genetic level for Chow. However, interestingly enough, in the 3D Chow viewer, it gives you that option. Again, this is just for funsies, none of this is actually possible in-game without the use of hacks, and obviously you were never supposed to see Chow like this. These are... Forbidden Chow. Like, let's take a look at a neutral run run Chow. Let's see what he'd look like with full power influence on top of this. Oh yeah, that looks powerful. Now let's crank up the fly stat. Oh yeah, looking good. Let's go ahead and max out all the stats. Damn, he looks straight up majestic. Look at this absolute unit. Or here, why don't we make the ultimate swimmy boy? And now, let's give him the ability to fly. And now let's make him fast. And finally, we make him strong. Oh yeah, I would not want to fuck with this guy. It almost looks like he's got another little face on his forehead. Little fucking Bizarro Sephiroth dude. And I have absolutely no idea what the fuck is going on with the child chow. This is beyond my mortal comprehension. Okay, I have to stop. I'll be literally doing this all day. Something really caught my eye when I was using Fusion's Chow Editor. A warning. Setting your chow's stat values too high can make them unable to complete races. Stats too high to finish a race? How does that work? Well, I decided to do some experimentation to figure it out. First, for reference, I hacked this little guy named Elvis to have the maximum stats possible you can normally obtain. Normally, in quotes, because it would take dozens and dozens of hours to breed and reincarnate and level up this Chow with the animal glitch. And actually, it would be a million times worse than that, because you'd have to be resetting every single time he leveled up without getting the optimum stat boost, and you'd have to be doing that for multiple reincarnations. Basically, it's theoretically possible, but it would take ages. And, uh, as you can see, it's fast. Very, very fast. Fast enough to handily win any race in the game. But what if we went even faster? By cranking the stats up to the absolute max, I made this little freak in nature. Sure, Spike sounds like a good name. Oh my god, look at him running around the garden. Just grabbing him is an actual challenge. Now, 65,535 may be the highest value you can enter, but the actual real highest value is 21,845. Once you go even one point higher than that, your stats effectively reset back to zero. So Chow with stats of 21,845, 43,690, or 65,535 will be functionally identical. So why don't we put him in a few races and see what happens? Right off the bat, I'm already seeing what that warning meant. Apparently, for whatever reason, if your Chow's intelligence stat is too high, it will simply sit here in front of the Jack in the Box forever, never opening it. I guess in its infinite wisdom it has determined the only winning move is to not play the game. So let's tweak its intelligence down a bit to fix that. Alright, let's try this again. Ooh, looks like he got spooked. Even with a maxed out luck stat, there's always a chance. Elvis has a chance to get a little head start. And there he is. It's here where I've identified the second issue with having stats too high. 
Again, for whatever reason, having your strength stat be too high actually leaves you unable to shake a fruit down from the tree. So he's just gonna be sitting here shaking this tree forever. You can fix this just by setting your strength down to a less extreme value, but for now let's try a different race that doesn't have the tree part. Yep, that's my boy. That is as fast as a Chow theoretically conceivably can move. Although amusingly, he still walks at a normal pace when he's solving the puzzle part. But the moment he's done, he just blasts off again. He's so fast, he keeps smashing his face in the walls and shit. He's so fast, he can trigger the pitfall, but have cleared the hole before he can even fall in it. Although it'll still cause him to trip. God damn, he's fast. He can clear the crab pool in about three seconds. Let's see how he does in a karate match. Yep, that seems about right. It turns out there's actually another stat that can be too high to complete a race. If his flying stat is too high, he can just fly straight over the goal and end up flying circles around it indefinitely. Depending on which track you're on, if there's a cliff anywhere near the ending, you may be unable to complete. Sometimes, if the flying stat isn't cranked to the absolute maximum, he'll land after circling enough times. Seriously though, look at this little dude, he takes off into the goddamn stratosphere. If you're wondering why Spike is green now, it's because he crashed my damn game, so I had to make him again, so I guess this is Spike 2. Also, depending on the race, there are some areas in which you can be going so fast you'll just find a little break in the geometry and fall through the map and then be unable to complete the race. These can usually be avoided by not mashing the boost the entire time. If you do just mash boost non-stop, you'll actually get stuck running circles around the fruit you shake down from the tree, so you need to ease up a little bit so you can actually touch it. Anyways, that's enough messing around with the races. Another thing that caught my eye in the Chow editor was this option. Unlock limits. Allow extreme values. I wonder what this does. Hmm, well it doesn't really seem to be doing anything. Let me just- oh my god, his head turned into a gigantic ghost fish. There, there. Good boy. Good... thing. Look at him go. Hey little dude, are you feeling okay? Jesus Christ, look at that thing. That is truly a Lovecraftian abomination. Oh god, look at the way it jiggles. That is weirdly disturbing. You got your wish, little dude. But at what cost? Be gone, demon! Interestingly, normal color chow will start to become transparent as you go beyond the game's limits. God, they're so weird. I think I'll just let them have this garden. He thinks they're so big they're covering up information on the menu screens. Okay, I... I think I officially have spent too much time in the chow garden. Time to wrap this video up. So will the Chow Garden return in the future? Maybe, I don't know. It's clear they haven't forgotten about Chow. There was a period of time you didn't see him too often, but they've been getting a bit more attention lately. Of the two people credited on working on the Chow Garden in both games, the lead programmer, Yoshihisa Hashimoto, no longer works for Sega. His last job with the company was as the director and lead game designer of Sonic Unleashed in 2008. He left Sega and Sonic Team in 2009 to work for Square Enix where he became the technical director of Luminous Studio, the engine later used in games like Final Fantasy XV. In 2014, he left Square Enix to form Libzent Innovations, a Japanese company that does... something. Anyways, the other person credited in both games is Sachiko Kawamura, an artist for Sonic Team credited with creating the Chao and designing the Chao Garden gameplay with Hashimoto. As far as I can tell, she still works at Sega, and she still works as an art director in modern Sonic games. I guess Sega could also just bring back the Chow Garden feature without consulting any of the people who originally came up with it. It probably wouldn't be as good, but it's a possibility. There seems to be a lot of fan demand for the Chow Garden's return. Whether or not Sega will listen remains to be seen. So, as I hope I've demonstrated in this short little video, there's a lot going on in this completely optional facet of the game. It was definitely more complex than I originally anticipated. I thought I could just shit out a quick 20 minute video on Chow, but every time I brought up one thing, it led me talking about another and another. At the end of the day, it's still not really my cup of tea exactly, but I can definitely understand the value and the appeal of this part of the game better. I totally get why there's still an active and dedicated Chow community to this very day. And if everything in this video I've discussed so far wasn't complex enough for you, you can always resort to using mods to spice things up even more. You should check out Chow World Extended, a collection of mods which introduce a number of changes you can read about. New fruit, items, colors, etc. It's pretty neat. Even without mods, the PC version's mod loader has an extremely useful cheat built in called the Chow Stat Multiplier that actually makes raising Chow somewhat tolerable without using the small animal glitch. Once again, I'd like to give a super special thanks to Chow Island, Moon Cow, Fusion, Justin 11 3D, and Sapphire Chow. If you have any questions about Chow whatsoever, please feel free to ask someone else because I am very tired of talking about them and saying the word Chow.